Valera. Looking forward to talking about sales tax for the next four hours. Thank you for your time. Oh, I'm just kidding. No, we're looking forward to talking about sales tax and this interesting Supreme Court case that just came up. Um, and I uh, appreciate you being here. Thanks, Arnold. All right. Uh, before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit um, about Avantico as an organization before I pass it back to John for the presentation. Uh, so we were formerly known as AX Mentor. Um, we recently were branded to align with Microsoft's uh, strategy to focus on D365 and not just AX. Although we do cover uh, all AX versions from 2009 uh, AX4 to 2012 R3 uh, and of course 365. We were founded in 2006 and we've been a Microsoft partner ever since. Um, uh, we've been a part of the TAP program. We have board members uh, and uh, that are a part of AXUG 365 or the CRMUG aside. Um, we have our headquarters in San Diego, California, but we've also covered the following states, California, Arizona, uh, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Utah, Minnesota, Georgia, Texas, and Indiana. We have professional, we have expertise in professional services, manufacturing and public sector. And our services include uh, everything from help desk, road mapping, uh, full implementation lifecycle, uh, managed service support, and post go live support. And that's just a little bit about Avantico, and I'll pass it back to John now. Thanks, Arnold. Again, this is John from Avalara. And Avalara is a long term partner with Avantico. Um, and we are the world's largest. Uh, player in the sales tax automation world. And something big happened in that world about a month ago. It's this Supreme Court case of South Dakota versus Wayfair. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm really not in the habit of watching the Supreme Court and reading Supreme Court blogs and, and something like that. It's usually not in my world. But this I found really interesting. I was following the arguments um, over the past few months. Um, it's interesting because it affects a lot of companies in this country it affects the way our our commerce is done so what we're going to talk about today are the sales tax truths what's all this about sales tax why is it important and then we're going to get into the ruling itself and talk about the main core concept of the ruling that is changing how sales tax will be done in this country that's this concept called economic nexus and what should you do about it? We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about the option of automating the sales tax compliance process. And we'll have some questions and answers at the end. So let's dive into this. And, and let's, uh, from a high level, what's important about sales tax? Why is it important to our country? Well, take a step back in time with me. Sales tax has been important for a long time across many civilizations. Sales tax helped to build the ancient pyramids. It helped to build the Roman Empire. And as for us, remember the Boston Tea Party? That was all about sales tax. Sales tax is a major source of revenue for our states. In fact, it, it brings in almost 50% of total revenues to the typical state. So these, these state governments, you know, they're taxed, tasked with providing programs and services. They, they have to build the schools, the bridges, the railways for our society. Well, where do they get that money from? Well, half of it comes from sales tax. That's why it's so important. It's so important that our government has it as a statutory requirement for businesses. Here I have it in a big orange background, big bold letters, statutory re requirement. But reality is not all companies think, think that it's a requirement. The typical company will react in one of three ways. They'll either fight it or they'll comply with it or they'll pretend it's not there. They'll take the ostrich approach, put their head in the sand and take the attitude of, I've never been audited, so why should I worry? Why is this? It's, it's, you've got a, differing reactions here to something that's a requirement. Well, it's because, let's face it, sales tax is just plain hard. It's difficult. Can I get a how hard is it? How hard is it, John? It's very hard, Arnold, as a matter of fact. 42% of people would rather get a root canal than go through a tax audit. 
same percentage, 42%, think that acing the SATs would be easier. Almost half of people think that solving a Rubik's Cube would be easier than to try to be manually compliant with sales tax. And as far as accountants go, 70% say that understanding sales tax compliance is one of the most difficult parts of their job. It is very difficult. And it's often understood. It's complex. The common misconception is that sales tax compliance is all about getting the right sales tax rate. Well, it's much more than that. There are six challenges involved with sales tax that we're going to dive into. The first is all about nexus. Nexus is kind of a weird word to most people. Nexus. What is nexus? Well, nexus is all about a trigger that a company will come across that will decide whether the company has to collect and remit sales tax into a state in which they sell goods or services. It's a rule. It's a trigger that determines a company's liability towards sales tax. For the past 30 or some years, that trigger has been all about a, having a physical presence. Does your company have people or buildings or warehouses or product in a state? If it does, then you've triggered uh, this physical um, presence definition. You've triggered nexus for the company. But other things have come into play that makes it much more difficult to understand what is a physical presence. Well, there's something like an, if you're investors, you have a board meeting in a state, even though you don't have people or product or buildings in that state, but you, your board had a meeting there, that can trigger the physical presence definition, believe it or not. Um, if you, your company attends trade shows and they make a, a sale during the trade show in a state where they don't technically have a physical presence of people, buildings, or product, the trade show attendance can trigger the so-called physical presence rule, and you can all of a sudden have nexus in that state. So nexus is a challenge for many companies. It has been for 30 years. And more recently, it's been a challenge for state and local governments as well because the Internet doesn't meet or did not until recently meet this physical presence definition. Internet sales didn't count. So you might have gone online and purchased something, and you might look at the receipt and say, hey, wow, this is cool. I didn't get charged sales tax for this. That's you know good for us at purchasing goods over the Internet, but it's been bad for the states because they didn't collect the tax on that. And 31 of our states are still in deficit. They haven't recovered from that recession we had several years ago. So they're, they're cash starved. They want that sales tax revenue, but they aren't getting it through Internet sales. In fact, and it adds up. There's close to $24 billion out there that goes uncollected on e-commerce sales that the states can't use to do the things that they should be doing with, with money like that. The second uh, challenge in being compliant to the government is all about tax, taxability. Is your product taxable? Is it partially taxable or is it not taxable? It can vary by state. It can vary by, on how the product is used. Um, here's some crazy examples. But, you know, this is all based on how our country was founded. It was founded on states' rights. So states have the right to come up with these sales tax laws in whatever means they deem appropriate. And it, so the laws vary from state to state. For example, you know, it's about breakfast time here on the West Coast. I just had a bagel. You know, I love bagels. And people in New York love bagels especially. If you walk into a bagel shop in New York City – and you purchase a bagel and you walk out with a whole bagel, you don't pay sales tax. It's exempt. But if you ask for that bagel to be sliced, that bagel falls into another category in terms of taxability. It's now taxable because it's considered a prepared food. That's crazy. So while I'm on the food kick, let's talk about candy bars in Indiana. If I walk into a convenience store in Indiana and, buy, and I buy um, a Kit Kat or a Twix, I don't have to pay sales tax. But if I buy a Nestle's Crunch, I do. Why is that? Well, it's because the ingredients in the Kit Kat and Twix include flour. And flour is considered a food, not a candy. So those candy bars are actually classified as food, not candy. So that's why you don't have to pay sales tax on them. So if you ever have a, a chocolate craving, but you don't want to admit it, 
and you just want to say, I had some food rather than candy, you can just say, I had a Kit Kat and Twix. It's a food, not a candy in Indiana. And what is this? Donuts in Texas, right? Is this some agreement between the Donut Manufacturers Association, maybe the Police Officers Association, and the state government? Because if you buy donuts in Texas and you buy six or more of them, you don't pay sales tax. But if you buy five or less, you do. Again, it doesn't make sense. It's all up to the states to uh, come up with these rules. They vary from state to state, and it's very complex, very hard to keep track of. Manufacturers especially have difficulty in keeping up with the taxability because manufacturers have to def, uh, deal with variable taxability in regards to freight, drop shipping, direct pay permits, and installation and repair services. They vary from state to state. The next challenge in trying to be compliant manually has to do with sales tax jurisdictions. That's where the sales tax rates come from. Um, the, the governments across the country have divided the map up into all these little tiny pieces, 16,000 pieces. Those are the sales tax, tax jurisdictions across the nation that we're looking at right here. At any one time, 20% of them are changing boundaries or changing rates. So if your company sells into all 50 states, you have to keep track of 16,000 sales tax jurisdictions. That's hard to do. And traditionally, uh, companies have been trying to cross-reference, to, to get the job done, companies have been trying to cross-reference zip codes with these jurisdictions. Let me give you an example here. This is, these are some zip codes in Colorado, outlined in white. The colors that you see behind them are the sales tax jurisdictions that are present in those zip codes. The reason it's like this is it's just the way it's always been done. And before cloud computing came around, the best tool that a company had to do or had to, had to have at it, its uh, use was this cross-referencing of zip code to tax rate. So what a company would do is create a table and the ERP would reference this table, and the ERP would say, I've got a, a, a sales tax uh, transaction here. The ship to is in Colorado. It's into, um, say, zip code 80111. And that table would say, okay, what tax rate are we going to assign? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here, uh, ranging from like 5% to 8%. So let's say 6.5%. So what the table is doing, what companies have traditionally been doing, is saying, in this particular zip code, let's charge a sales tax rate that is a generalization. It's close, but it's not exact. The question becomes, is that good enough for an auditor to be close or to be not exact? Dive down a little bit deeper in this one zip code, 80111, and there's nine different tax sales tax rates that you can choose from. Now, if you pick the one in the middle, 3%, like I said, you'll be close, but you won't be quite accurate. There's a better way to do this now, which we'll talk about later in this presentation, using latitude and longitude um, that will actually get that transaction, the, the ship to, right down to the rooftop level rather than have to generalize through a, a zip code. Bottom line is using zip codes to determine tax rates is an inaccurate pro process nowadays. Then there's the exemption certificate challenge. Many of the companies out there are doing business B2B. So many of them have this attitude that, most of my sales are exempt, so I don't have a sales tax problem. But it's much more than that. Remember in this company, in this country, you have to either collect and remit sales tax or prove you're exempt from it. You prove you're exempt from it by keeping exemption certificates on hand. But that, it's not that easy because employees find those exemption certificates difficult to collect. They're not trained on how to validate them. Certificate retrieval is time-consuming and hard, and one single missing certificate could cost the company much more than the taxes the company failed to collect. And exemption certificates are the first thing that an auditor looks for in an audit. So if you don't have the exemption certificate or it has the wrong information on it or it's out of date, it's an easy gotcha for an auditor. So it's an often overlooked challenge in the compliance process. And then there's the prep and filing. So that you can so that you can send out the returns and, and pay for the sales tax liability. It all comes down to a calendar. There's, there's a, a deadline involved. 
sales and tax data usually needs to be aggregated across multiple billing systems, then reported on the correct form for each jurisdiction. Also, states send requests for information that require a response that, that takes time uh, to work on. All of this preparation for the filing process takes a lot of time, which brings the company no value. You know, there are other projects that the accounting department could be working on that actually bring value rather than trying to keep the company compliant manually. And then the final challenge is all around, are we ready for an audit? How quickly and accurately can the company respond to an auditor's request? And you know what? Keeping a company compliant manually isn't free. Someone in the accounting department or a team of accountants needs to, to be on top of this. And they aren't working for free. In a small to medium-sized business, um, the company is paying someone or a few people around $70,000 a year to keep the company manually compliant. In an enterprise or large company, it's a team of people, and it adds up to close to $400,000 that is being paid to get this task done. But you know what? 75%, three-quarters of CFOs will admit that if an audit were to incur, the auditor would likely uncover errors. This stat blows my mind. This is crazy because you've got three quarters of all CFOs saying that we aren't really doing this correctly, but yet they're paying $70,000 to $400,000 for someone or a group of people to get the job done incorrectly. Why is that? It's because the sales tax compliance process has long been overlooked in our country. It's been considered just a cost of doing business. Well, there's a way around that now because a cost is a cost. I mean, this, this process brings no value to the company. It can be, and if you get it wrong, it can be very costly to the company. It could put the company out of business. Bottom line, sales tax compliance, if done manually, can be defined as high risk, no reward. Why would any company want a process that it operates that can be defined as high risk, no reward? And what could the cost of an audit be? Well, over half of all companies have found that the cost of an average audit is over $50,000, but that's not including um, the time spent for employees to prepare and support the audit, back tax payments, and penalties and interest. Sales tax bottom line, the audits are not fun. Almost half of all accountants who have been through one consider the experience more difficult than a divorce. And once audited, expect future audits. You're on the list. Then this happens. Okay, now this whole presentation is going to turn to from the challenge of doing sales tax compliance to what's new, what's changed. And this happened about a month ago. The Supreme Court case, like we mentioned at the beginning, of uh, South Dakota versus Wayfair changed the rules. It struck down this previous case, which was Quill Corp versus North Dakota, which came up with the idea that nexus would be determined on a physical presence. It's, it's replaced the physical presence trigger for nexus with this concept of economic nexus. What's economic nexus all about? Well, it's a collection obligation imposed on sellers based on their level of economic activity within the state. It's not all about whether they have a physical presence. It's all about their economic activity. What do I mean by that? Well, in the case of South Dakota, what happened was, you know, South Dakota is a small state, relatively speaking. They don't have that much sales tax revenue coming in to begin with. They saw Wayfair um, and their, inter their big Internet presence, of, of, you know, the Wayfair has. You know, I'm not much of a TV watcher, but if I sit down to watch maybe the evening news for an hour or two, I'll see two or three com commercials, it seems like, from Wayfair. They're very aggressive in their marketing. So South Dakota had that same opinion as well, and South Dakota said, wait a minute here. We need this sales tax revenue from all these sales that Wayfair is um, collecting from our constituents. So South Dakota really referred to it as representation without taxation, kind of the opposite of the um, Boston Tea Party. So South Dakota took it to court, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and it was decided in favor of South Dakota that economic nexus will replace the physical presence definition. So what does this mean specifically? It means that if you're 
a company that is outside of South Dakota selling into South Dakota, and if you sell in excess of $100,000 in a year or you have over 200 sales in a year into South Dakota, you've now triggered nexus in South Dakota. You have to collect and remit just South Dakota sales tax on your sales into South Dakota. Um, so the effective date is, is to be decided really soon. The bottom line here is that the physical presence rule has been overturned. So where do we go from here? This is the way things are happening in South Dakota. It is now the rule of the land. So you may have some questions. Say you're already registered in South Dakota. Does this court decision apply to you? Well, the ruling will not affect any company already registered there and collecting in South Dakota. So you're good. But does it apply only to online transactions, only to e-commerce merchants? The answer is no. This ruling applies to any company selling into South Dakota, whether you're shipping a physical product into South Dakota, whether you're providing a service into South Dakota, or whether you're selling online uh, through e-commerce into South Dakota. Does the economic nexus rule apply to non-taxable -tax transactions? No, this, this ruling does not change what's taxable or what isn't. So those are the three most common questions that we've seen coming out of this ruling. So what happens from here? Well, we've got South Dakota that is going to be implementing this law. Or they, they have the law in the books. They just haven't really enforced it. Same story is true for 19 other states. All these states in blue have economic nexus laws on their books that they're now going to enforce. Um, these states here uh, with a bold um, type, they're the ones that have decided to put an effective date in play after the decision. So what are we going to see from here? Well, from what the experts tell me is we're going to see this map start, start to turn from gray to blue over time. What is going to happen most likely is that those thresholds that the Supreme Court said were okay for South Dakota to use, the $100,000 in annual sales or the 200 um, sales transactions, those two thresholds are, are you know, most comp most States are going to copy paste. They're going to take that South Dakota's law, copy it for their own law, and it's spread, going to spread likely across the nation. Not all states will adopt those same thresholds. Uh, for example, I think Illinois, uh, their uh, thresholds are more like $500,000. They may change those thresholds as a result of the Supreme Court decision. It's up to the states to determine exactly what the thresholds would be. What I'm saying is um, more likely than not, they'll copy what South Dakota is putting in place. So it's coming. So what can you do about it? Well, first of all, don't panic. Everybody breathe. It's all right. We just have to deal with it. What you can do first, if you have a SALT CPA or attorney, tax advisor, give them a yell. Give them a call. Ask for their advice on it. If you don't have a SALT CPA or tax advisor, um, you can give us a call. We have a, a network of tax advisors, SALT CPAs that we could refer to you. Or you could work with us. We have a tax advisory service that can help you in any step of the process here, um, from uh, a nexus study to being getting registered in new states um, to automating the process. We have, and I'm going to send this in, in a follow-up um, email after this presentation. We have an FAQ guide. We have an, a guide to economic nexus. Uh, I'll send links to expert videos and our blog, all the information that you could have or, or that you might want to use if you want to dig into this a little bit further. So another option is to automate the process. Many companies are looking at that nowadays, and it, its time has come. And you could look at automating the process the way that companies did back 20, 30 years ago with a very similar process when they automated payroll. The two processes, payroll and sales tax compliance, are similar in that neither trying to be compliant with either brings no value to the company. And if you get payroll tax wrong or sales tax wrong, it could be very damaging to the company. So if you automate, if you outsource payroll, why not automate sales tax compliance? Top performing organizations are seeing the light, and that's exactly what they're doing. 72% of the top performing organizations are likely to leverage some portion of automation. They might 
get real-time updates as to tax rates or tax rules, and three and a third of them are likely to automate the entire process from the tax, from the rates, the rules, to the tax preparation, finally, even remittance and recovery. When you automate the process, you're addressing all of the challenge that, challenges that I mentioned previously. With a Nexus challenge, you can add your Nexus liability with just one click in the software. With product taxability, you can use our built-in rules that are constantly updated because the solution is a SaaS offer, offering up in the cloud, always up to date. Um, you can find which jurisdiction would apply to get the tax rate um, using an address. And as I mentioned before, uh, latitude longitude technology to get down to the rooftop level rather than using zip codes, which is inaccurate. You can automate the exemption certificate process so you don't have to handle all those exemption certificates manually. You can do the prep work and the filing. Um, you can actually outsource it so you don't have to deal with it anymore. That's pretty cool when you think about it because the accountants that are handling this process are college educated, very talented people. Um, if their time is being used to be manually compliant to the government, then is that a good use of their time? Could that person in accounting be assigned to a process that actually brings value to the company? Maybe put that accountant on a process that will bring in more revenue to the company, maybe um, tighten up accounts receivable. Or could we put that person on a, pro on a, a project that will determine a go or no go on putting a new product into a, a new uh, environment and seeing if that makes sense financially. Those are good uses of an accountant's time, not necessarily being manually compliant to the government. And finally, if you automate the process, you'll be ready for an audit. When the auditor comes in, they're looking for errors because they want to bring money to their employer, the government. They're looking for errors. And if they see a system in place that's automated the process, they're less likely to hang around. Think of this, rather than the auditor asking for questions about where's this exemption certificate or show me this invoice or show me how much tax you paid here. You can just say to the auditor, here's your credentials. You can use our system for the next three days. Go, go at it. Go find any information you want. You have access to our system. You can answer your own questions yourself. That's the power of being ready for an audit through automation. How do we do it? Well, we have um, a few software uh, titles up in the cloud. Our, our um, workhorse is called Avatax. And how this works is that your e-commerce software, your shopping cart, your point of sale, or your ERP um, will send a sales tra transaction up to Avatax. It'll knock on the door and say, hey, Avatax, I've got this sales tax transaction shipping from this location to this destination. Tell me if it's taxable then Avatax kicks into gear and it looks at the address and validates it. Then it looks as to whether it's taxable or not. And then it um, brings down, uh, it goes to the exact jurisdiction, right to the rooftop, and brings back the tax rate to the uh, ERP shopping cart or point of sale system. So there you've got a complete transaction that has uh, the tax rate associated to it. And all the rules, all the rates are always up to date in the cloud in Avatax because we're monitoring everything that's going on in the government. And then we have CERT capture that comes into play for um, non-taxable transactions where CERT cap capture will monitor, say, the ERP, and it'll see if there's an exemption certificate on hand. And if there isn't, CERT capture will automatically reach out in an email to the, the distributor, and it'll say, we don't have an exemption certificate here. Could you please send us one, or could you please send and an updated one because the exemption certificate we have on hand is out of date. And then finally, we do the tax returns. We automate that entire process so the preparation work isn't involved anymore. And like I said, we could put those uh, accountants to a higher and better use. Um, we automate the returns filing process and even the payment process to all the jurisdictions in which your company has sales tax liability into. Over 20,000 customers are doing this right now, and it's growing like crazy. By, in just four short years, this stat is ama still amazing to me about the growth, but in four short years, 
that number, 20,000, is going to grow by 40 times. It's catching on just like 20, 30 years ago, the idea of automating payroll caught on. If you were to walk outside your door and, walk, and go from one company to the next down the street, you'd be hard-pressed to find a company that doesn't outsource payroll, right? Well, in four years, that will be the same situation with sales tax compliance. You'll be hard-pressed to find a company that doesn't automate sales tax. It's just that the time is right right now because of cloud computing, because of SaaS, to automate this high-risk, no-reward process. Do you have any questions about everything that – that I've gone through? Uh, yes, sir. we have one question. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, uh, please comment on the sales tax strategy. Quote, when in doubt, collect the tax, end quote. We use the strategy for those states we have nexus, and if there is a question about if a product or service is taxable, we charge and collect the tax. Please comment on that, John. Um, well, I'm not... Um, it's a salt CPA or a tax advisor. I just play one on TV. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, you know, what I would say to that from everything I've, I've heard, that's a good strategy. Um, your, it's a conservative a approach that will um, m more likely than not save the company in an audit rather than put a company at risk. You're, you're, you're you know, uh, looking at it from, I, I don't want to, get in trouble. I see the potential that this is for the company uh, versus the other approach is I've never been audited. Why should I worry? Why should I collect the tax? You know, so I would say that's a, that's a, that's a very positive approach at it. Is that um, the, the answer you're looking for that, like my opinion on it? Um, it's not, um, you know, give me a call. My number, you know, will be provided here at the end of this slide and then a follow up. Uh, give me a call and we can talk further with someone who's a lot more knowledgeable as far as the details on uh, strategy and tax compliance. How's that sound? Uh, I think I think if he could answer right now, he'd say it sounds good. But okay, um, <laughs> sounds good. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll hold on for another thirty seconds uh, to see if there's any other questions that might want to be entered in on the right hand side here, and if not, then uh, we'll just end the webinar early. Great. I, I do have a story while while we're waiting here. Um, just briefly is, um, you know, I, I work for Avalara. I, I talk about this all day long, but I don't work in the compliance department of a, of a company per se. So I, I don't live this as part of my job. I, I talk about it. So I'm, I'm at a conceptual level that I'm talking about this, but it really uh, came home uh, to me uh, in a better understanding of it. The other day when I was um, uh, having dinner and, uh, I was talking about sales tax. It was, you know, a bunch of guys that I work with. And um, the gentleman at the table next to me overheard what we were talking about. And we were talking about the Supreme Court case. And he said, you know what? I am so happy that this happened. Um, and he began to explain as to why. Uh, the gentleman owns a camera shop in San Diego. And he sells high-end cameras. Um, and he had just had a sale, or he hoped it would have been a sale. Um, and the a customer was in his store, and he, he went through a complete demo of this very expensive camera, $10,000 camera. Um, and he went through the sales process. He established rapport. Um, he was about to make the sale. Um, he printed the invoice, presented it to the customer, and the customer said, oh, wait a minute why are you charging me $800 in sales tax here? I could buy this online and not have to pay sales tax. Well, that was, that's an example of how brick and mortar companies have been at a disadvantage compared to internet companies um, until now. With this new economic nexus law um, and this Wayfair decision by the Supreme Court, the playing field has been leveled. So now if that customer 
were to go to purchase that um, same camera online, maybe not now, but within the next few months, within the next year, sales tax will apply. So that's something, that's an interesting uh, situation that I just ran into. All right, thanks for sharing that, John. Um, so I haven't received any new questions, so I'm just going to wrap up today's webinar. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We have a survey coming to you uh, right after this webinar. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill it out. Uh, thank you, John, for the presentation. The, the information is very educational, and I'm sure many of the attendees have a better idea on how to move forward with their sales tax compliance. I hope to see everyone in the next Great. webinar. Uh, goodbye, and have a nice day, everyone. Great. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.